please welcome Shan Budram, Sriha Srinivasan, Amanda Johnson Morrison, and Deja Fox. Hi, friends! What's up? Okay, so it's the end of the day, and we're here to talk about sex. So I feel like we should start things off with a collective ooh. Ooh. You didn't take part, you didn't take part. I can see, I can see what's happening. One more time, a collective, just let it all out. The day, the knowledge, the things you're gonna bring back to energize your company, energize your passion and purpose. I want you to put that all in this ooh, you hear me? One, two, three. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> That's that felt good. Uh, okay, so you talk about sex with your friends. And I want to introduce you to my friends here today and tell you a fun fact about each of them. This is the wonderful Deja. Deja, I want you to wave like this for me. <laughs> These nails were gorilla glued on backstage. <laughs> That's my girl. That's true. This is Shriha. Everybody say, hey, Shriha. What's up, girl? <laughs> hey. hey. This entire outfit, she put together last minute after a wardrobe malfunction. This is a borrowed blazer, ladies and gentlemen. If you can't clap for that. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, 360. And this, this right here is my girl, Amanda. Say what's up, Amanda. Hi. <laughs> last month, Amanda got married, launched a company, and started watching Game of Thrones from the beginning for the second time. Woo! Round of applause for Amanda. Amazing. Now, our friends are also incredible women who are doing sensational, groundbreaking things, specifically in the sex education space. And I want to start with you, Deja. Now, actually, I have a question for everybody. Clap as loud as you possibly can if your sex education high school was incredible. Clap as loud as you possibly can if you did something about it. This is your cue. You clap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> After going into a sex ed class that was taught by a baseball coach who knew nothing about it, Deja said something has to happen, and you took that something a very, very far away. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, so when I was 15, I was experiencing what one in 30 youth in the U.S. do, and that's called hidden homelessness. So I was bouncing around between friends' houses and eventually began living with my boyfriend at the time and his family, right? So we can, we can imagine why sex education was important, why birth control access was important. I was wanting to go on to college to be the first in my family to attend university, and I knew that an important step was having this information, being able to take control of my body, take control of my future, and the baseball coach, Coach Wiley, just wasn't doing it. <laughs> it wasn't cutting it, Coach. Um, and I was sitting in this classroom, I remember him going through this PowerPoint on birth control, and actually making kind of a comment that your parents are gonna fill in, the, like, handle this. And I was sitting there thinking, not my parents. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing this on my own, and knowing that there was other students in other classrooms feeling that exact same way. And so I started showing up to school board meetings and telling my story. I opened up about my story with homelessness for the very first time at one of those school board meetings. And I remember shaking, holding this like little post-it note. There's only maybe 10 people in the room and like five unpaid elected school board members. And something really clicked for me where I realized that my story was an agent of change making. My experience made me an expert and put me on this playing field to really get up and make a difference. And so I started bringing my friends along to do the same and the rest was history. After six months, we won a unanimous victory. Um, and I sat on a curriculum review board rewriting that curriculum for the next year and a half. Shriha, you are going next month to do something incredible for all of us. You are going to advocate to free the pill. And the journey to you getting there, you told a really interesting story about sitting at the table with your mom, who is the smartest person that you know, and arguing about holes down there. Yeah, so my mom is in the audience. This is the first time I've ever told this story with her to listen to it. Um, but like I said, my mom is so educated. She has multiple graduate degrees. I've like always looked up to her and we were sitting there arguing. I must've been like 13 years old. And I was like, mom, we have three holes. Like people with vaginas have three holes. And she was like, no, 
it's two. And I was like, okay, mom, like think about it. When you have a tampon in, you can still pee, right? And she was like, you can? And I was like, you can, like that's two different holes. And so that got me started. That was kind of my, I know, I know. <laughs> that was my cultural buy-in to sex education and that's when I started doing it in person. Um, and then I was doing sex, sex education in person. I live in Solano County, yay, like Northern California. Um, that's right. Um, and I, my senior project was gonna be to work in Vallejo High Schools to give them better sex education. COVID hits my senior year. No prom, no graduation, no nothing. And I still needed to graduate high school, right? This project that I'd worked so hard on was like totally in the dumps. And so I was already making TikToks for fun, just like about my high school, about my life. Nobody was seeing them, but I was making them. <laughs> um, and I started making sex ed TikToks. And my fifth video, a dance about chlamydia, so I was known for chlamydia, <laughs> went viral. And about a year down the line, Free the Pill, I work with Advocates for Youth in DC, reached out to me and they were like, can you do a promotional video for us? Can you host an event? It's like, sure, sure, like this is so fun, I love doing this. And then I was like, I kind of want to be doing it too. Like I, I also want to Free the Pill because you might have realized you can't walk into a CVS or Walgreens and buy birth control off the shelves. You can in 60 countries around the world, but you cannot in the United States. And so after a 40 year fight, the application to the FDA to Free the Pill is out right now. And the advisory committee is happening in November in DC. It's the only public opportunity for the public to get involved and tell the FDA, yes, we want this. And so I will be going to DC to fight for that. Thank you. Aren't our friends cool? She, okay. Amanda, thank you for taking a break from Game of Thrones. That is a very laborious time. Very, very intensive. You started a makeup company called Minted for Women of Color. And now, got some fans in the house. Uh, now you do early contraceptive and are slated to be the number one donor of EC by January for a company you just started last month. Yeah. Okay, but fill in the gap for me from makeup to pharmaceutical. Yes, it can seem like a leap, but I promise it makes sense. And so the bridge is that, um, kind of no matter what you're doing, whether you're putting makeup on your face or you're ingesting medicine, it's very, very personal. And you probably experience it and see it and think of it differently because you are a woman in the world, right? And like your experience is coloring and shading all of that. And so for me, I have often felt othered by so many dimensions, right? Othered because I'm from the South, other because I'm a woman, other because I'm black, other because name of other. Um, and so that was my big why into cosmetics. I felt like, Women of color weren't being seen, we weren't telling our stories, we needed to make our own products and tell our, create our own spaces. And so after five years of doing that, I really saw like, wait, this applies to so many areas, right? Where women don't have the voice we want at the table, the story, the product, the community, you name it. And so my big why for Julie, the current company I'm at now, is women need to have a seat at the table when it comes to healthcare. It is personal, it is our bodies. We don't wanna just be told, here are the side effects, good luck. Like, we need more, we need sex education. We need to know what our medicinal choices are. And so it's been a new big adventure and September was a huge month. I did a lot in that <laughs> month, but um, certainly launching this company has been like super special. And I'm very excited to now be in the fight up here with all of them. Thank you. There's actually a fourth panelist, a silent panelist, but a really cute one. This is Julie, <laughs> which just launched two months ago. We, we just launched like a little less than a month ago. So we are now in Walmart nationwide, which I'm super excited nice. about. It's emergency contraception, the same FDA approved pill that you all have come to know and love. And one of the things you talked about is our donation program. So for every Julie purchased, there is a Julie donated. And so we are donating on the quarter. January is our first big donation. It'll be just under 300,000 units, which we're still fact checking, but will make us the largest donor of EC in the country and a really big market for a startup. <laughs> okay, I wanna just frame this conversation by saying sex is good, yes. sex is yeah. great. There's a lot of politics and stress and shame that surrounds sex, but the core heart of it all, it can be something very powerful, something very pivotal for us all. So I want you to tell everybody here, why do you advocate for their pleasure and their children's pleasure? Why is it important to talk about sex? 
Oh, I can start. Um, so I think it's, as you said, sex is good. Um, sex is natural. We all have the parts to do it, so why not? And then I think it's just about like, how do we create the space to talk about it and how do we do it like safely and thoughtfully, right? But like that needs to be the conversation, not if we have sex or if it's shameful or oh, you're a slut or you're a this, like all of that is just meaningless labels that frankly have held us all back for far too long. Amen. I think you said it so well, Shan, when you we were talking about pleasure. Pleasure for women is empowerment, right? Like you shouldn't feel ashamed to talk about pleasure. We shouldn't, we never talk about masturbation. Why is that? Why is it that when I walked into classrooms as an elementary schooler, they would be like dicks drawn on the table, right? The guys would talk about jacking off and this and that. And yet we don't really talk about it. I was lucky, I had friends that honestly, like we almost had like a little book club of sorts. It would be like, guys, did you know you can touch yourself? I know, which was crazy, but like these conversations made us more comfortable. And when I came to college, I worked with UCLA sex experts, go Bruins. Um, and um, I would have these conversations with folks and I'd be like, you know, you can buy a vibrator, right? Like, it's okay, like there's one at Target, I promise. Like, and I promise it's not gonna hurt you. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be something fun that you can do. And I think when you destigmatize, I love that word, when you destigmatize these conversations around pleasure and you make it something that's not to be ashamed of and you make it something that you can talk about with friends, you can talk about with your sisters and nieces and moms and everybody, you're able to then have those conversations about making it safer and making it something that you can do without having to always be worrying about that in the back of your head because you deserve that. Shreya, where's your mama at? We gotta point her out. Cause I want to. She's holding the phone her. in the front. <laughs> I gotta make eye contact with her every time you Oh. Um, that's making me emotional, seeing your mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I came into this work, I already told you, I got up in front of my school board members and admitted to them basically that I was having sex. And then I got up in front of my senator and I pushed him, he had voted to repeal birth control funding for uh, Planned Parenthood, asked him why he as a white man was making decisions about me and my body. It went viral overnight, millions of people had seen it. So then by proxy, I admitted to millions of people that I was in fact having sex. Um, and the line that has been incredibly difficult for me to toe as a woman who works in politics is that my politic has always been about sex. Mm -hmm. Has always, it has never been separate, right? And so when people try to reconcile the, the me that they see online, who's a content creator who posts ads for vibrators and pictures in my bikini, but also this young woman who was the youngest presidential campaign staffer in modern history, right? And they're like, that doesn't go together. I'm like, look at my origin story. It has never not gone together. It has always been the same. Because for me, sex, is politics and politics is sex and my politics is sexy. Yeah. So yes. a lot of you, a lot of our politicians cannot say the same, a lot of them. I wanna talk about the issues that are still very present in sex education today. Yeah. But can I start with some people in the audience from your sex education, what were the, what were the issues? What were the gaps? Anybody have anything they wanna share? <laughs> the lights are on you now. Ooh. Oh no. What sucked about sex ed for you growing up? So tell my story. Do it. So my father would not sign my permission no. to have sex ed. And my mom forced him to have the sex talk with me. Right? And so my dad comes in and this is his talk. He says, my dad was a 30-year law enforcement retired to keep that in mind. He comes in and he says, baby, princess, sex will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> kissed me on my forehead and walked out of the room. And then this is what happened to me. So I was in the ninth grade, I was 13. And by the time I was in the 11th grade, one of my best friends became pregnant. Mm. I was in my room in tears, completely torn apart because I literally thought she was going to die. Right? So my mom comes in the room and she's like, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And I said, I'm ugly cry everything. Ren Renee's gonna die. Right? As per your dad. And she's, per my dad, who was my hero and I believed everything out of his mouth. And actually this was the only bad advice he ever gave me in life. <laughs> <laughs> and so my mom says, why is Renee gonna die? And I tell her Renee is pregnant. 
And she says, well, that doesn't mean she's going to die. Renee's going to be okay. And I said, no, daddy said it's going to kill her. Sex, she had sex. That's how she got pregnant. Like my mom didn't know where babies came from. (laughs) And so my mom says, she's not going to die. Calm down. I'm going to get your father. (laughs) And so she goes downstairs and tells my dad, why did you tell her this? Are you crazy? What are you doing? And so they both come upstairs in my room. My dad says, Renee's not going to die, but sex will kill you. (laughs) (laughs) And if it doesn't, I will. And I love you. And And that is the problem right there. (laughs) Thank you for your dad. Shout out to moms doing the work. For people who are on Ground Zero, specifically Shreya and Deja, who are really working with the population who needs this information the most, what, is, what are the issues, what is the key issue that's still present today in sex ed? Yeah, I can jump in on this one to start. So after the viral moment, after fighting for sex education in my school district, I came back home because I realized that these politicians were holding the keys, right? Whether they be school board members who got to decide about what I was learning in the classroom or senators who got to decide what pills I could or couldn't have, right? Um, And so I really wanted to create a community-based alternative, and Advocates for Youth is actually a part of this story. Um, I started alongside other young people and nurse practitioners a program called the El Rio Reproductive Health Access Project, where we hired young people who were untraditional leaders like me, who had experienced homelessness, who were living in group homes, who were teen moms, formerly incarcerated, and trained them to be peer sex educators, paid them for their labor, and then put them into clinics where teens could come in and get access to free uh, STI testing, birth control at no cost to them. And it still runs today. And it's because it's community sustaining. And it does this piece, which I think is the thing we need to kind of leave behind, of putting people in power who are the most, who are the closest to the issue. Yes. Right? Why shouldn't they be the ones? Yes. Why shouldn't they be the ones being paid for that work? Um, And so I think when I look forward to the future, that peer provider model is where I think we should be heading because it's what we're already doing when we sit with our friends and we're chatting, but it's really about creating those communities of care um, and installing knowledge in our communities that regardless of election, can't go anywhere. Yeah, I think peer education is really where it's at. I work in Solano County, similarly with low-income minority youth, uplifting them into the public, spa- uh, public health field because right now that field looks very monotone, right? Like you don't have that many women, you don't have that many people of color up there. And that really showed during COVID-19 that we didn't have the folks to be educating communities because black and brown communities have been hurt by you know, the government in the past, by healthcare in the past. And so it's so important to be educating these youth. And that's what I do with social media. That's what I do with the skills that I've learned is, one, I have, you know, around 30 high school interns in Solano County that are working to go into the public health field. But two, you may not know this, ever since the 70s and 80s, the U.S. has funded abstinence-only sex education. Comprehensive sex education exists in other states. California is one of them. But abstinence-only sex education is still federally funded under the Biden administration. And that's crazy, because that means that there are kids out there that are being told sex will kill you, essentially. If you have sex, you'll get all of these crazy STIs and all of these things will happen to you. Which is why I think, you know, I'm at Sex Edu on TikTok, because it's so important to do this in the digital space, where I started out making videos for a local audience. That's where I thought my videos were going to go. And then I had kids talking to me that were basically like, I actually don't know what that means at all. You know, like, I've never heard of these terms when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to birth control, STIs. And that's when I was like, okay, we need to, we need to like, back up a little bit. We need to talk about definitions because these videos are reaching a lot of people and in conjunction with the like boots on the ground work, you're able to reach all of these kids and they're able to intake it at a speed that's good for them and in a place that they feel comfortable. And so I think that digital sex education is so important as well. Now, Amanda, I asked the question of the audience of who here had great sex education in high school. It was silent. Yeah. And uh, it's silent. It's, it's like a generational joke, a bad joke at this yeah. point, to the point that Deja has made we have to do something about. But there's a community of people who are specifically impacted by this who often don't get an opportunity to speak out about it, marginalized communities. Yeah. How are they impacted by a lack of sex education and a lack of access to birth control like EC? Yeah. Um, so... I'm not going to bore you guys, but I'm going to hit you with a couple numbers because I think they're really important to help frame exactly what's happening. So almost half of the pregnancies in the U.S. every year are untimed or unwanted. 
That's a lot of the pregnancies, right? 19 million women in need live in contraceptive deserts in the US, meaning that the health centers around them cannot provide adequate care, right? So then you take into account that black and brown people will take emergency contraceptive multiples less than white and Hispanic people. Um, people with bachelor's degrees are at a higher, will take emergency contraception at a higher rate. Um, there are a lot of factors. Add in the fact that there are only, I think it's 17 states that require sexual education to be medically accurate. There are only four states that prohibit religion in sexual education, meaning you can talk about subs, um, abstinence, you can just say Jesus will fix it. You literally like can say anything and it'll be funded. Yep. So if you add all these numbers together, the outlook is pretty bleak, right? And I think that's why we are where we are, but also why we have so many voices saying what needs to be said. So I think if you are a woman who lives in the Midwest or Texas or the South, good luck. If you are a brown woman anywhere in this country, good luck. If you don't have a high school diploma, good luck, right? You will probably be one of the 50% of women who experience an untimed or unwanted pregnancy. And now your options are limited. So even more limited, frankly, than where they were before. So it's a serious conversation, and I think it's easy to say, oh, well, I didn't have this, or oh, but think of it, take a step back. It's a much bigger problem, it's much deeper, it crosses class, it crosses race, it crosses income, and like, there are gonna be a lot of solutions and startups that happen in the space, but we really need comprehensive reform. And so, to all the black and brown women everywhere, Good luck. And my hope is that Julie reaches people, the name of the company is Julie, we've personified healthcare. Uh, Julie <laughs> reaches people in this interesting way via social, right? We're making palatable, interesting TikToks and Instagrams to reach people in places that sex education isn't gonna reach them. We have an amazing medical board of practicing physician women who are making TikToks all day long. Like one of the women on my medical board has 1.4 million followers. She's a practicing pediatrician and she literally describes sex all day long on TikTok. TikTok because she needs to, because who else is doing it? And so I think the work is going to come from certainly some governments who are going to try government, you know, different initiatives that are going to try and fix this, but probably from advocates and the commercial sector that can really make a difference and like push things forward. So that is what I'm hopeful for. Thank you for that. That was beautiful, beautifully said. I want to know, it said last question since I've gotten here, which I'm like, does that mean it's over before it even began? But <laughs> just in case, I know you guys are all hungry. I do want to move into the lightning round right now. Yeah. Can we all do a <laughs> lightning round of questions? <laughs> what is something, everybody in the panel, will start with you, Deja, that we want to leave in the past when it comes to sex or sex culture? Yeah, I mean, I want to leave politicians making decisions about... Just politicians, next question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I just, I want to leave politicians out of the bedroom. I think that's what we're leaving in the past. Is, that was the full question? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah I want to leave stigma behind. Like, for yourself, like, leave that stigma behind so that you can feel empowered to have pleasure. But in your conversations with your kids and your, like, nieces and nephews and the young people, even maybe, like, your older sister or aunt, don't stigmatize them and open the door to having those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the only way if you're on Medicaid to get a reimbursement for emergency contraception is to have a prescription when the drug itself doesn't require a prescription. So I would like to leave in the past all of these barriers to access that we have created that unfairly um, stigmatize and prevent access for low-income women everywhere. Yes. All right. Lightning round question number two. <laughs> Friends, I thought we were doing this together. No, it's just a me thing. Okay. When you think of the future of sex, and I'm giving the future curves, I'm giving it juice, I'm giving it juice. When you fantasize about the future of sex, what do you see? Hmm. I mean, I think I see people in the public space, women owning their sexuality um, and not getting backlash for it, right? Being able to live their life online as a whole person, uh, as a sexual being, 
um, and not be unfairly, unfairly, you know, by the algorithms or by their peers or by their workplaces, be treated unfairly for being a sexual being, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I really agree and echo with that. I see current generations, but also future generations that feel empowered with themselves in the sense that, one, they have the knowledge to know, this is how I can access contraceptives, and this is how I can keep myself safe, and these are like what STIs are, and not feel all of this confusion that just like leaks into the bedroom and makes it so that you're not able to have a fun and good time. And so if the future looks like empowered people having fun pleasure and fun sex, I'm gonna be so thrilled. <laughs> Um, uh, I would say from period to menopause, you know how your body works, you know all of the solutions that are available, and there is no shame at any part of that process. Yes. Uh, okay, this is the final lightning round question. <laughs> yes, friend! It just takes one <laughs> the afterwards. <laughs> And I would love if you guys could stand up and take your moment. Can we put the, the lights back on for everybody else? Because this has to do with us. We're friends. We established that, right? Friends talk about sex together. And also, too, friends feel empowered to advocate for each other's pleasure. We want each other to have a good time. High five the person beside you. You want them to have a good-ass time. You want them to feel good. You want them to be empowered. And there's some work behind that high five. Oh, leave me hanging. Don't leave me hanging. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Can we start with you, Amanda? Can okay. you step forward and tell everybody here, if they want to get involved in making the change they wish to see in the world today, yeah. what can they do? Oh, OK, yeah. Um, so Julie has an amazing donation program. If you would like to get involved, buy a Julie for everyone that is purchased. There is one donated to communities in need around the US. Stocking stuffers. <laughs> Stocking stuffer. <laughs> I know what my friends are getting this year. <laughs> All right, so for me, if everyone could get their phones out right now and go to act.freethepill.org. So that's act, A-C-T, dot freethepill.org. Don't have to do this right now. Maybe over dinner, a glass of wine. I don't know, whatever you're into. You have an opportunity to, if you scroll down on that website, you can actually click a link that will teach you how and allow you to message the FDA, so send them written commentary. Advisory committee is on November 18th. Before that point, any letter sent to them will be taken into account, they will have to read it, and they will make a decision on November 18th. All of these experts will vote publicly yes or no. And historically, the FDA goes with whatever this advisory committee says. And it's important to say, this issue affects me, right? Like, you're talking about my life here. And this is your opportunity to not only get your voice heard by the FDA, but to be a part of reproductive justice history. Wow. If you're not galvanized Head now. Talk loading? <laughs> is there a TED <laughs> talk in the future? <laughs> Um, we all know there's a midterm election underway, right? Mm -hmm. Early voting has already begun. And so I want to remind each and every one of you, I feel like this is a, a crowd of registered voters, right? Early voters. But we all have personal networks, whether they be digital or in real life, that are completely unique to us. And so I want to encourage you to get in your influencer bag for a minute and influence the people around you. Your relationships are so valuable and the people who care about you are going to care about what you care about. So make a plan with your friends, make a plan with the young people in your life, make a plan with your neighbors, your partners, your family, to make sure that everyone around you is getting involved and getting out to vote. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much to my friend Julie. Thank you to my friend Deja. Shout out to my girl Shreha, Amanda, Thank and you, all Shane. of you. Yeah. Have a great That's day. Let's hear it for Shane. <laughs> right. Please welcome Makers team member Angelica Arnold. All right, thank you for that warm welcome. Can we give another hand for this last panel? Yeah.